Thank you for the invitation. Oh. So I apologize, I've just picked up a cold on the flight, though. so I'm not feeling great, but uh, it shouldn't really affect my talk. Uh, Giovanni, so it's an Italian name. My uh, dad was Italian. He was born in South Africa, but his parents were from Italy. So my grandfather came from a place called Luca in Tuscany. Very beautiful place if you've ever been to Tuscany. And my mother was English. So uh, South Africa is like Australia in a sense, it's a polyglot, lots of uh, immigration, lots of people, a lot of mixing. And I went, um, I trained in a hospital in South Africa called the Johannesburg Hospital. And I went to a university called the University of Advantage Road. Um, and I left South Africa in 1993 to go to London to do a PhD in Research MS, and I never came back. So I've been there uh, 21 years. So I was asked to talk today to and to give you a talk about um, the new paradigm, the new type, uh, I shouldn't say a paradigm, but it's a new shift in the way we are thinking about treating MS uh, and how we should preserve the brain. Um, so I don't pull my punches, unfortunately, because one of the things I'm, I try and fight is patronizing doctors, telling patients good news when it's not really good news. I think you need to know uh, the facts. Because uh, if you don't know the facts, you can't make the decisions about treatments. Because some of the new treatments, are extremely risky, uh, and I think the risks of these new treatments are worth taking if you understand the risks of not taking these treatments. So I think, uh, so I will uh, be telling you some things that you may not like, but I will be finishing with a very positive message. Okay, and let's make it informal. So if you really want to ask questions around a particular issue, put your hand up uh, and discuss those. So this is where I work. Who's been to London? Well, most people have been to London. So this is a, a hospital called, it's called the Royal London Hospital now. It used to be just called the London. And it's on the east end of London. And it's actually one of the oldest uh, hospitals. Not quite the oldest. Our, our sister hospital in St. Bartholomew is the oldest hospital. But it opened up in 1740. And it was the first free hospital in London. And the reason why it opened up was for Perpy. And um, so if anybody who went to the London didn't have to pay. So it just kind of was the front runner or the forerunner of the NHS. And still the Board of Trustees do not allow us clinicians to do any private practice on the London site. It's just not allowed, okay? Because the ethos of the place is free healthcare, socialist healthcare. But it's a very, very famous hospital because some amazing things have happened at that hospital. You all seen the movie The Elephant Man? Okay, Joseph Merrick was the elephant man and he actually lived in the London hospital in the old grocer's wing. Um, other things, it was one of the first. It was the first hospital to introduce X-rays in the UK. All the most of the, the people, the staff that used the X-rays, died from radiation exposure. It was the first hospital to use light therapy to treat tuberculosis. And uh, my predecessor who worked there, well, his name was Lord Brain. And uh, in the MS field, he's quite well known because in 1931, he put together a monograph, a uh, almost like a textbook. It was the standard of all the information on MS for about 25 years. From, uh, it came out in 1931 and was subsequently replaced in the mid-50s by a textbook called McAlpine's Textbook of MS. So it was, so, so the Royal London um, is a hospital um, that has a big connection to multiple sclerosis. And if you see at the bottom corner over there, I'll just show you with the arrow, um, we moved into a brand new hospital in 2012. <coughs> it's the biggest hospital in Europe and the most expensive. It cost uh, 1.1 billion pounds to build. We're still paying the bills because it's on a mortgage. <laughs> but it had to open, we had to move in in 2012 because it was the official hospital of the Olympic Games. And this is the research institute I work in. It's called the Blizzard Institute. Not a blizzard in terms of snow blizzard. But it's named after a surgeon, Thomas Blizzard. And interestingly, Thomas Blizzard, if anybody knows anything about medicine, was the first person to describe tetanus, which was a medical condition. But he worked in the uh, rectal area as an anorectal <coughs> surgeon. And um, it was an extremely interesting building. It's won a whole lot of design awards because the whole purpose of this building is to uh, try and change the way we do research. So all the labs are open space, we share all the resources to try and uh, help uh, create a different type of environment of doing research. And these are the open labs, and that white structure there is probably meant to represent um, 
an uh, organelle in a cell called the mitochondria. And we, and we have meeting rooms in there. Let's have a look, a look of it. And this one's called Spikey. It's also a big meeting room. It takes about 30, 35 people in there as well. And this is our lecture theater attached to the blizzard. And you'll see it's all green. Okay, and there's red dots in it. This is meant to represent the poppy fields in France from the, uh, from the, the First World War. And this particular structure is called center of the cell. It's meant to be an embryo. Those little orange bulbs are meant to be um, cells. And inside there, there's a public engagement multimedia show. And it's designed to bring school children in it. School children visit this center to learn about research, to try and infuse them with science. So I'm not sure what happened in Australia, but about 20 years ago, there was a massive drop-off in school leavers studying science in school. So there's a big national campaign to try and stimulate uh, people going into the sciences. Okay? Because I actually think modern economies have to be underpinned by scientists and engineers. Uh, and we've had over 20,000 school kids through there, and the good news is that in the UK now, the number of people studying science subjects at universities has gone up. Uh, anyway, we won, um, our universities won several awards for, these, for the public engagement program. Anyway, so Edmund and Daniel, I'm going to tell you about my connection to MS. So this is a, a picture I took off the internet, but it's somebody on home dialysis. And um, my father had renal failure. Um, and uh, he probably had a condition, an autoimmune disease of the kidney that he developed when he was a teenager. He kept having pairs of blood in his urine and his GP and took it seriously. And when he was in his mid-30s, he presented with very high blood pressure and they found he had renal failure. And the uh, nephrologist, the expert who looked after the kidney, said to my father, a pity you didn't come earlier. You could have saved your kidneys. Yeah. Uh, so in other words, his doctor, okay, his general practitioner, ignored the symptoms and never referred him in. So by the time he got there, he had end-stage renal disease. And this is what a normal kidney should look like. And my dad's kidneys were all shrunken, shriveled up. And the nephrologist called this an end-stage kidney. Uh, it's too late to do anything about it. It's damaged. So that's the analogy I want to use for talking about multiple sclerosis. Uh, because we, we don't think about the brain as an end organ. But the brain is an end organ. Okay? It's, a, it's an organ in the body. And it does fail in MS. And by the time we make a decision about treating it, we often let it fail or go too far, and we can't do anything about it. So, to try and raise awareness, I developed a, an infographic. <clears throat> and um, we have a big MS meeting every year, it's called Ekrams. Uh, and I had a meeting like this, well, there wasn't as many people with MS uh, in the room. But, uh, and I showed them the infographic uh, to try and explain to them about the impact MS can have on individuals. And I didn't like the infographic because it was really, uh, it didn't, I didn't put it in punches, I, I told the facts as they are. But it kind of, the infographic is there to explain to you that if you do not treat MS, the damage it can do is not only to the brain, but what it does to individuals at a social and occupational level. And one of the things we've been, we know now is that the brain in MS shrinks at a certain rate. Uh, the good news is, and I'll talk about it at the end, we have therapies now that can slow down this brain atrophy or even potentially normalize it. I say normalize it because most of us, um, when we get to about mid-30s, our brains shrink anyway. That's part of normal aging. <coughs> so these are some of the figures that you need to know about MS. So this is data collected in the era before we had therapies that we treat MS. Okay. Did you know that people with MS are 40% more likely to have divorce rates than normal people? <coughs> you know that 10 years after diagnosis, uh, well in Europe at least, 50% of people are unemployed. That's a scary figure because the average age of 1 is 30, which means by the age of 40, half the people, half the people of MS are unemployed. Okay? And by the time people are needing a wheelchair, 80% uh, are unemployed. This is a very scary figure. So when people present with their very, very first clinical attack, in other words, the first manifestation of their meds, about 50% half of them will have problems with the way the brain functions if we test it using detailed testing. Okay? 
The suicide risk depends which study you look at. The incidence of suicide in MS patients is about two to seven times higher than the background. It's a particular problem in young men. It's a particular problem in young men. So the average time from developing MS to needing a walking stick is 20 years, uh, and for a wheelchair, 30 years. And the next thing is very, very scary. This is a British study, and we did this particular study to try and see the impact of MS on an individual's life. And the MS, the UK society, okay, rated the quality of life for someone with multiple sclerosis um, who was essentially lost upper limb and lower limb function has been worse than death which is a very scary. There's only one disease, this is the only disease that ever scored this bad in you know, this particular uh, um, uh, analysis. Um, I don't know if you're aware, but MS does reduce life expectancy by about eight years. Now that's not a lot. If you could, you know, the average life expectancy now is around about 80 years if you're a woman, and mid-70s if you're a male. So if it shortens your life by eight years, it means that you're living most of your life with a disabling condition. And the next figure is a figure that's very, very important because um, how many people in this room have optic neuritis, inflammation in the optic nerve? Okay. So the, the reason why the optic nerve is so interesting is because we can use the eye to study an individual lesion. Because we can look at the back of the eye and count the number of nerve fibers using a technique called OCT, optical coherence tomography. And we now know that after a single attack of optic neuritis, a single lesion, you lose about 20% of the nerve fibers in the eye. Okay? I know you, most people recover vision, but they recover vision not because of those cells surviving, the other cells take over and the eye adapts. So one attack in the optic nerve destroys one fifth of the nerve fibers. And I think that's something we need to remember is that these lesions cause damage and we've got to stop them from occurring. And when you go into the brains of people who die of MS and you look in those lesions, you count the number of electric wires, the axons, the nerve processes. There are 11,000 of them that have been cut by the inflammation. And if you look at normal people, okay, there's less than one or one uh, in that the same. So I think the message is, is that in the brains of people with multiple sclerosis, these little inflammatory lesions are causing damage. Which is why we now have treatments to try and suppress and get rid of these lesions from coming. And which is why I try and promote this concept that if we are going to treat this disease, we need to treat it as aggressively as possible to stop all these lesions coming, to stop all the damage. Okay? And we do know that in the gray matter, which is the surface of the brain, and we don't see the gray matter now very accurately with our current scans, but if we look at the gray matter, we find that there's extensive inflammation, okay, the MS process occurring in the gray matter. This is the, the figure I would like to point out. You can see in the top figure over here, you can see a, a brain of a normal person dying at the age of 70. And this is the brain of somebody with multiple sclerosis. You can see the difference in size. So the average loss of brain in a, in a normal person is between 0.1 and 0.4% per year. And a person with multiple sclerosis is double that, okay? between 0.5 and 1% per year. And this picture down here is just showing you uh, an individual with MS. I, I studied this individual when I did my PhD. And this scan over here was done at time zero, baseline. And this scan was done 18 months later. And you can see how much the brain has shrunk. Those little black things in the middle are called the ventricles. And you can see them getting bigger. So this is the bad news. So uh, please don't go away and think this is going to happen to you because this is information that was collected before we had treatments. Okay? So this is what happens to MS if we don't treat the condition. I think you need to know that so that when we talk about treatments, you can put this into perspective. And I thought, almost certainly this has all changed now that we have therapies. So one of the things I one of the problems we have is um, I'm not sure about Australia, but I, I, I've learned since I've been here that the neurologists in this country have access to almost all the treatments from the word go. So almost all the treatments in this country are first-line therapies, and it's uh, up to you, a neurologist, to decide which treatment to go on. Uh, I suspect sometimes the insurance payments are, are, uh, dictate what therapies are used first or second. But in the UK, we have to use them in a very strict order. We have to use 
the first line of therapies first, and you have to wait to fail those therapies before getting the second, more effective therapies. So to try and change that uh, way of thinking, um, I, I, I started thinking, well, maybe we start making people think about how damaging MS can be. If we don't treat it properly, they'll change their behavior. So one of the things I thought about doing is, can we make people think about MS, untreated MS, as being a dementing illness? And that sounds terrible because you get, you get these images of usually old people in uh, retirement homes or in, in nursing homes with dementia. But that's not how we define dementia. Okay? We define dementia, I'll go through the definition of dementia, but I think MS can fulfill the definition of being a dementing illness if we don't treat it properly. And I think that's uh, a concept that will at least help us um, get the healthcare payers, and, and particularly in the United Kingdom, there's this organization called NICE, to allow us to use the most effective treatments uh, early on. Anyway, I did, a, I did a survey in my blog um, after, after posting about this, and uh, most of the blog readers have multiple sclerosis. And um, after reading the information I put on the blog, uh, do you agree that MS is a mental illness? You can see the majority of people, over 60% agree, maybe it was 17%, and only about one in five people didn't agree with that. And the next point, which is the point I really wanted to get across from this information, is do you think, and I call people MS, MSs, this is the noun, MSs should be allowed early effective treatment to prevent cognitive impairment or dementia, and the majority, you can see that, 80% uh, said yes, only 6% of people said no. So there are some naysayers out there. But the most majority of people think we should treat this disease very aggressively early on to prevent these complications. So now this is how we in medicine de define a dementia. Dementia is a loss of mental ability severe enough to interfere with normal activities of daily living. It needs to last more than six months. It mustn't be present since birth. And it shouldn't be associated with any loss or alteration of consciousness. And this is our current definition. Okay, our current definition. And uh, uh, activity daily living can be broken up into components called physical, mental, social, how we interact with each other, and occupational. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, I can tell you now, MS lasts more than six months. It's not present at birth. And we know that people with multiple sclerosis don't have an alteration of consciousness. So it ticks all those criteria. Okay, it doesn't tick the other ones. And we really know, I've just, I've just shown you some uh, data, and you all know it, that it does affect physical functioning. It affects people's ability to walk, use their hands, bladder and bowel function. It definitely affects mental functions. Um, it affects cognition, it affects mood, anxiety. I mean, I, I, and I've already mentioned to you in my infographic about the social and occupational thing. And this is the uh, study that I wanted to highlight. This is from Denmark, I'm just showing you that Ten years after diagnosis, half the people are unemployed in Denmark. It's, it's probably worse in the UK. Probably eight and a half years, the figure in the UK. And this is the figure from, uh, from Europe. You can see all these studies participated. There were many thousands of people in this particular study. Just showing you that by the time uh, uh, you reach the score, well, you, know, you all know what the EDSA score is? Some people shake their head. It's called the expanded disability state of scale, we as neurologists use it to grade how bad the impact of MS is on an individual's life. And so 3.5 is actually very low. If somebody walked through the room with an EDSS of 3.5, they would look normal. We'd have to examine them, do all those tests you go through, you get the neurologist and your scoring system to get 3.5. So 3.5 actually, on the outwardly looking, looks normal. But people are unemployed when they have very little outward disability. So there must be something else driving this. Something else driving this. Not the physical disability, there must be something else driving this. Okay, and this is what it is. This is cognition. This is thinking ability. So when people are presented with their first clinical attack, and we put you through a detailed set of tests that take about two hours to do, we would find that there are subtle abnormalities in the, in the way the brain functions. We call this cognitive impairment. And uh, over 50% of people, when they present with their first attack, already have this present. Now, you won't be aware of these things because the brain is incredibly adept at compensating. It's very adept. We call it plastic. It's got compensatory mechanisms. The way this manifests, though, is that 
to compensate, it requires a lot more mental energy. And this is one of the reasons why people with MS complain about fatigue. They find doing co cognitive tasks extremely tiring. It, it requires a lot more mental energy to achieve a task than somebody who is normal. Uh, and this is probably what impacts, this is probably the reason what's driving uh, early unemployment is the cognitive fatigue and the difficulty it is doing cognitive tasks. And we live in a knowledge-based economy now. Most of the new jobs that are created in our economy require cognition, thinking ability. Okay? So I think it ticks all these boxes. Now that's clearly not the same kind of dementia as somebody with Alzheimer's disease. It's much more subtle than that. Okay? much more subtle than that. But I think people need to be aware of this because we now have treatments to prevent this. Okay, so... Now, the, I put this slide in. As I shouldn't have put it in because it's a big term. Pathology means what we see under the microscope. Okay, and what is causing this cognition problem? And this is what's causing this. This is a beautiful slide that was made by Professor Bruce Trapp. He works at the Cleveland Clinic in the United States. He's a pathologist. And what you can see here is in an acute lesion, this is an acute inflammatory lesion, that the nerve processes are being cut. Okay? So this is actually a, a nerve process. It's been cut and there's a bulb forming. Right, and on this one here you can see that um, where you've got this green, it means that the myelin, the insulation around the nerve has been stripped away. Okay? And this is that study I referred to you of 11,000 cut nerve processes per cubic millimeter compared to one in normal people. So this is really the reason why people with multiple sclerosis develop problems with their thinking. It's because these inflammatory lesions are doing this damage. And this is what's causing the brain to shrink. Now when does this process occur? Does it occur in secondary or primary progressive disease? Or does it occur early on? And it's quite clear from looking at MRI studies, that the brain is shrinking from the very beginning. So there's some people called CIS, it's the first event, they're having some shrinkage of the brain in the very beginning. So I actually think this process is there from the very, very beginning. These are people that are not on treatment, by the way, from the very beginning. Uh, so there is no magic point where you become secondary progressive. I think the processes that are causing progression are there from the beginning, and the reason why uh, you develop progressive disease is because the mechanisms that we use to compensate fail. So what I'm saying is early on, you, you, your brain is compensating, you're using other areas of the brain, and you cope. And then after uh, several years, those mechanisms are exhausted, and that's when <coughs> progressive disease starts. So I think all the evidence supports the disease being progressive from the very beginning. From the very beginning. And uh, at some point in time, you then present with progressive disease. And I've already shown you these two pictures. <clears throat> so now I want to show you, okay, now this is hypothetical. So I drew these curves to try and illustrate to you what happens. So this is what happens to normal people. This is the brain volume. We've each got about 1,500 milliliters. And um, from about, about the age of 35, our brains shrink normally, okay, part of aging. And there's a normal range, obviously. Some people's brains shrink quicker than others. Um, and there's this concept called brain health. Uh, I don't know if you're getting a lot of publicity about this. It's happened in the uh, aging literature. There's certain things that keep us younger, our brains younger. One of them is exercise. So people who exercise are protected from developing Alzheimer's disease. Probably diet is important. Brain uh, activity, people who read a lot, uh, jigsaw puzzles, who do crossword puzzles, who play bridge, protect themselves from um, Alzheimer's disease. People who don't smoke, people who don't develop high blood pressure, all these things protect our brains, keep them uh, younger. Interestingly, in the women's literature, hormone replacement therapy, HRT, is another factor that keeps brains younger. Okay, so uh, there's a lot of factors that we can do to improve our brain health. So the people who've got Healthier brains obviously shrink slower, and people who are a little bit more unhealthy, maybe the smokers amongst us and all that, shrink a bit quicker. Okay? So there's a normal range. This is what happens in MS. 
So first of all, when you present with your disease, your brain's really shrunk a little bit because this process probably starts even before you have your first attack. Uh, and then people with MS shrink at a much uh, What's happening there? <coughs> so people with multiple sclerosis shrink at about... Um, so this normal range is between 0.5 and 1. Shrink at about 0.75. People, normal people shrink between 0.1 and 0.4, so around about 0.25, okay? So you can see by the time you're each 80, there's a, people, normal people lose about 5% of their brains, <coughs> which is normal. And people with multiple sclerosis lose about 30%. So these are people who are not being treated, by the way, so this is no treatments, okay? And that, so that explains why these two brains look so different. So let's try and get this to work now. Now the good news is we've got treatments that work. So this is one of the drugs. This drug's not available yet. It's called the Quinamon. And it's been shown to reduce the shrinkage of the brain by 30% compared to people who are on a placebo drug. Okay, so this person's brain has been lost, this group of people have been lost at 0.8% over two years. That means it's about 0.4% per year, which is on the cusp of being normal. And this is the second study, which is called the Bravo study, just showing you, confirming it. So in, when we do clinical trials, we always have to do one study and a second study to show that the first study was correct. So both these studies have shown that this particular drug slows down the shrinkage of the brain. And what's so interesting about this drug is its impact on relapses, attacks, and on the lesion on the scan wasn't very good. Okay, only reduced relapses by about between 20 and 25 percent. So this drug was not licensed in Europe, it was not licensed in the United States, and it's not going to get licensed in Australia either, because it wasn't good enough to stop relapses, but it's stopping brain shrinkage. So this is the first drug that we've got, okay, that doesn't have a very big impact on those lesions, but it's slowing down the shrinkage of the brain. So it's very, I think it's very exciting. It's telling us that these two processes can be targeted differently. This is the drug from Gonomet. Some of you may be on this drug. And the, other, the name for it is called Gelenia. And this is just showing you, uh, there was two groups of studies. This is the transforms compared to uh, interferon. Um, okay, you can see that Gelenia reduces the shrinkage of the brain by 40% compared to an interferon. And, oh my goodness. Sorry about this. This is the cursor Windows 8. Okay. And you can see compared to placebo, it reduces the shrinkage of the brain by almost 40%. And if you go across there, you'll see that that is at the 0.8 over two years. So it's reduced the brain shrinkage to 0.4% per year. And I told you 0.4% was the upper limit of the normal range. There's another drug that stops the shrinkage of the brain, okay, stops the end organ damage, okay, bringing it towards a normal uh, range. This is the other drug called natalizumab. The other name is called Tysapri. Some of you may be on this. This is given as an infusion once a month. And this is probably the most effective drug that we have available at the moment. What you've got to do is you've got to ignore what happens in year one. Because when you go into a powerful drug that suppresses inflammation, it gets rid of all that swelling and the brain shrinks quicker. What we have to do is look at the second year, okay, when the drug is really working. And what happens in year one to two, you can see people who are on dummy drug were shrinking at over 0.4%, and people on Tysabri were shrinking at 0.24% per year. That is in the normal range. Now, I don't know if that's normal, because we don't have a normal control group. So I think in future when we do these studies, we should actually include normal people and compare the brains of the MS to normal people. But I can tell you that this is very, very good. Okay? Very, very good. 0.24%. And this is probably, this is what I would call a highly effective therapy. Because Tysabri not only stops the brain shrinking, it also stops relapses and it stops those lesions on the scan. But it's it stops the inflammation and it stops the shrinkage of the brain as well. And this is another drug, um, it's called alentuzumab. Have you heard about alentuzumab? It used to be called CAMPATH. CAMPATH stands for Cambridge Pathology. 
And this is a, probably the most potent drug that's going to come out, and it's just been given a license in Europe, and we started to treat people in Europe with this drug. The way this drug works is, is that actually you give it as an infusion for five days in year one, and you give it as an infusion for five days in year two. So you just give two short courses, three days in year two and five days in year one. And what it does is it destroys all your immune system, it destroys it and it lets it come back, it lets it reboot itself. And the idea is by destroying it, you get rid of all those immune cells that cause MS, and when it comes back, it doesn't come back with the autoimmune cells. Okay? And I want you to look at year two. Now, this particular study was not compared to dummy drug, not to placebo. It was compared to interferon, to rebirth. And you can see in year two, in the first study, if you received uh, interferon, your brain shrunk by 0.5% above normal. Okay, and if you had alemtuzumab, it reduced it to 0.25%, well within the normal range. And in this study, you can see in the year 2, 0.35 and 0.22. Okay, so this is another very powerful drug that reduces not only relapses in MRI activity, but stops the brain shrink. So the good news is all those bad things I was telling you about, there are therapies now that can slow this process down. So now this is another hypothetical. So here we have the normal range. Here we have what happens in MS. And we're going to give you a, a moderately effective drug. And you can see that if we start late, say 10 years after onset, it will slow the disease down, but it won't put it into the normal range. What happens if we use this moderately effective therapy earlier on, so it's right from the very beginning, it will reduce it by about 18, to 18%. So you can, go, you can see there, 20, minus 20, minus 18, not very effective. As soon as we go on to these more effective therapies, okay, you can see if you started late, it reduces it by to, to, to minus 15%. If you started early, it puts it down to minus 11, and it puts it in the normal range. Okay? So the message I want to get across to, to you today is now that we've got these very effective, what I call highly effective therapies, okay, they're beginning to address all those processes that we think cause all those problems in people with MS. Okay. The point about these treatments is we need to give them as early as possible before the damage occurs. So this is the message I want to get across is that if we're going to make a big difference to people with MS is we have to use these very effective therapies as soon as possible to prevent the damage. And this is now a study, um, we call this a meta-analysis, it's a terrible term. But what we do is we take all the studies that have been done on brain shrinkage and we look at them all together. And uh, the statistician who does this is a, she lives in Italy, her name is Maria Piersomani, and she's put together 13 studies that have looked at the shrinkage of the brain of all the different drugs. And she shows that there's an extremely close correlation between shrinkage of the brain, and I'll put this over here, this is called the atrophy, the shrinkage of the brain, okay, and progression, disability progression. And also, there's quite a strong correlation between the lesions that come and go on the scan and progression. And when you put these two together, you can see there's almost a straight line. The more effective the drug, in other words, the, the more it suppresses relapses and MRI activity, and the, slow, and the more it suppresses the shrinkage of the brain, the more it predicts or stops progression of this disease. Okay. And if you were a statistician and you saw this figure called an R squared, that's 0.75, that is extremely, extremely good. Okay, it means 75% of disability in MS, 75% of disability can be accounted for by the lesions that come and go on the scan and the shrinkage of the brain. Which is why we, when we now use treatments, we must use treatments that target both of those processes. So, when, uh, so now defining the window, <coughs> when we should use these treatments. So I go back to this particular example of this drug Alemtuzumab. And if you do any Google searches, uh, the trade name is Lemtrada. <coughs> the company called Genzyme make it and they call it Lemtrada. And if you use this therapy late in the disease, when people have got a really progressive disease. You stop people having relapses, 
okay, and you stop them having new lesions on their scan, but unfortunately the progression still continues. It probably go, occurs at a slower rate, but it still continues. If you use the therapy very early on in the disease, okay, very early on in the disease, most people, almost all stop having relapses in MRI activity, and most people find that they actually improve, they actually have an improvement in their disability which tells us that we probably should be using these drugs as soon as possible in the course of the disease. Okay. So, uh, for this particular reason, this drug has been tried in very early areas. Which is why in Europe now, uh, we've been given permission to use this treatment as a first-line therapy. As a first-line therapy. And I would imagine if things, uh, if it goes to form in Australia, you'll be uh, the option will be also to use this treatment as early as possible. So this particular slide tells you that if you're going to use these early, uh, very effective therapies, you should get given them as soon as possible in the course of the disease. And I put this up because everybody ignores this. So um, we forget that 25 years ago, the first interferon therapy became available, called betaferon. Is it called betaferon in this country or is it called betaserol? Depends where you are in the world. It's called betaferon, yeah. Okay. So what happened in this particular study is that all the people that were in the trial were followed up for 21 years. And they got almost 100% of the original study participants back. Only four weren't found, and there was one particular center that wouldn't participate in the study. Everybody else was found. And after, as you can imagine, these people were in their 30s, 40s, and 50s when they went into this trial. And after 21 years, some of them would have died. Okay? It's just because the, it's a, a long-term follow-up. And they found that the um, majority of the people who had died had died of MS-related complications, uh, infections or pneumonia or whatever. But what was very, very interesting is that if you had interferon from the very, very beginning, you had a f almost a 50% lower chance of dying than if you had to wait three years to get it. Because in the trial, Half the people were given, well, a third of people were given dummy drug, placebo, and the other two thirds were given interferon. Uh, and so the people on the dummy drug had to wait three years before they were given the active therapy, so there was a delay in the treatment. And just delaying access to an interferon therapy by three years had an impact on survival of being alive at 21 years. Now, interferon is not a very effective therapy, by the way. It's a moderately effective therapy. So if interferon can do this, can you imagine what these new drugs that are much more potent than interferon can do? So I actually think we, in an era now that when we've got highly effective therapies, this is going to be even more profound. More profound. So the current paradigm is we shouldn't wait to treat. We should try and treat as early as possible. And I make the argument, if you believe in the data that you've got now, is you actually don't want to mess around on a therapy that's not effect that effective, you want to go for the big, most effective therapies as soon as possible. And then we're going to make a big difference to the disease in the long term. So um, I'm, not, I'm not criticizing the neurologists, I'm not criticizing people, but there are two different schools of thought. Some people prefer to start off with one of the le less effective therapies and wait to see what happens, to see if you respond or non-respond, so they want to go this route. And other clinicians, other neurologists, prefer to be more aggressive. And it's not either or, it's a mixture. It depends on you as an individual. Some people don't like to take risks with high-risk therapies. So, uh, other people will take risks. Okay. Um, so some people will want to have the most effective therapies uh, early on. I've got another one again. Okay. And hopefully we can, what we call flatline people. And I can tell you now, I look after a large number of people with early relapse and remitting MS who had this treatment and a large number of them are what I call flatlining in the sense that they've had these effective therapies and they function almost normally. They've got no relapses, we scan them every year, there's no new lesions, they're fully functional okay, and they're almost normal. Uh, the question is, are, have we cured them of their MS? I don't know if we've cured them because we've got to wait many, many years to find that out. And some of the naysayers will say, well, all we're going to be doing is they're going to come back in 15, 20 years' time with progressive MS. And that is a possibility because there's two theories of, of going around. The one theory is that 
MS is a degenerative disease, uh, and the inflammation that's causing the relapses, okay, is not that important. What happens is, uh, uh, so what will happen is they'll come back, they'll come back uh, with progression. But the other people say MS is an autoimmune disease, and if we can get rid of autoimmunity, people will be cured. So this experiment is running right now. We will know the answer to this in about 10 years' time. So those people that have had alutizumab, all right, some of them are, uh, there's a cohort in Cambridge that have had it for over 12, uh, 12 years on right now. The ones in our current trial, uh, between 5 and 7 years. So we need to wait about another 10 years and we'll get the answer about whether or not uh, this treatment can cure MS. I say that because I actually do believe that if you use these aggressive therapies that reboot the immune system, they may, it may cure some people of this disease. The point about it is you've got to do that therapy at a stage when the brain is not damaged. It's like my father's kidneys. If he had had the aggressive immune therapy when he had kidneys that were working, he wouldn't have needed a renal transplant or dialysis. Okay. Now what is quite interesting is, um, do, you know, do, do any of you know anybody with rheumatoid arthritis? Okay. So the rheumatologists have discovered the same lessons that I'm trying to promote here 20 years ago. So rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune disease of joints, and the rheumatologists realize that they should treat rheumatoid arthritis very aggressively, as quickly as possible, to protect the joints. And they showed that with studies done 15, 20 years ago. Uh, and I've got a, a colleague who lives around the corner from me who's an orthopedic surgeon, and the reason why I know him is because his son is in the same school as my daughter, and I've met him at uh, various school events. He's a bit older than me. But he said to me, uh, when he started off as an orthopedic surgeon, half of his lists, he's, a, he's, a, joint, he's a, a, a shoulder and knee expert, so he does shoulder and knee replacements. He said, 20 years ago, half my surgical lists were rheumatoid arthritis patients to replace joints. He said, if I do one rheumatoid arthritis patient a month now, it's a lot. Okay. So the rheumatologists protect joints. Uh, they treat um, uh, rheumatoid arthritis very aggressively, very early on to protect joints. So I don't see why we can't do the same to protect the brain. The difference between the rheumatologists and us is the rheumatologists can at least refer their patients for joint replacements. We can't refer people for brain and spinal cord replacements. This doesn't work. Okay? So this is why the brain and spinal cord is so precious. We need to protect them as soon as possible. Okay. So I'll leave you with the question is, can you name me any diseases uh, in medicine, where we don't treat early and aggressively. I know one, I know one, uh, it's prostate cancer in older men, sometimes the treatment is worse than the cancer, but apart from prostate cancer in elderly men, I'm not sure of any treatment where we wouldn't try to treat it early and aggressively, so I don't see why we should treat MS any differently. So, um, uh, we need to protect that particular brain, it's very, very precious. Okay, and uh, so the concept is time is brain, you shouldn't waste time. So I, I do think MS is a dementia, but I think it's a preventable dementia. So if we treat it earlier, we can prevent the dementia. Okay. Anyway, so uh, I've got a lot of stick when I gave this talk at Ectrans. People afterwards were very upset with me for making them so depressed about this disease. So um, I did a survey and um, people think using the term dementia is very stigmatizing. Okay, it associates MS with Alzheimer's and all that. So I think we should just call it cognitive impairment. So I use the term dementia just to scare you today, okay, and to raise the awareness. But I think we should refer to it as being, uh, 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 we, should, we shouldn't stigmatize people. But I think what's very, very important is that we should use the early cognitive problems that people with MS do to try and change this paradigm, try and change the attitude uh, to how we treat this condition. Okay, and, then I'll, uh, and I, don't, I don't want you to go away with the message because people often say oh, all you're doing is promoting treatments. Disease modifying therapies, the drugs, are just one part of it. The other part, of all those other things I've mentioned to you, is you need to look after your brains anyway, just because you're human. Okay? You need to stop smoking, you need to exercise, live a healthy lifestyle. Okay? If you've got high blood pressure, you need to control your blood pressure, you need to stop yourself getting diabetes, etc., etc. All those things that apply to the normal population should apply to people that are as well. Alright, so I thought I'd also um, 
just quickly give you a thing. We haven't forgotten progressive disease. A lot of people criticize me. Oh, you only just talk about us treating people early with relapsing disease and you've forgotten people with progressive disease. And we haven't. Because I do think we can still modify this course of the disease even if you have progression. The problem is our current paradigm, our current um, trial design is not very efficient at finding drugs to protect the brain. We call these neuroprotective drugs. So currently we have to actually test uh, drugs. It takes up. At least two to three years to do a trial, and we need about 600 people with the disease to test these strategies. So we got we put 300 on active treatment and 300 on uh, 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 placebo, and we look at them for three years to see the impact of this. That's far too long because this doesn't take three years. It takes about two years to design the study. It takes about two years to recruit the study. Three years to run the study. Then we have to analyze. It takes about seven to eight years to do one study. And if you've got MS, you know that eight years is a long, long time in the life of somebody with MS. So what we try to do is a new type of design um, that involves doing lumbar punctures. But when you do a lumbar puncture on people with MS, we can often find this protein called neurofilament. So neurofilament is actually a protein that sits inside the axon, the nerve processes. And when you cut those axons, you release the contents. And we can measure that protein, that content in the spinal fluid. And we know that if you've got raised levels of that protein, you're much more likely to do badly than if you've got normal levels. So this is like a, a test to see how bad your MS is by doing a lumbar puncture. And obviously the idea would be, is can we take you, if you've got raised levels, and shift you from the red box to the green box, from the bad prognostic group to the good prognostic group? And we can. This is what happens when people go on to pass every, and that's losing that. Before they go on it, their levels are very high, when they go on the drug, it normalizes it, okay? Normalizes it. So we do have drugs that work. So our plan then would be to actually test this in a trial. And um, look at the numbers. We only need 30 people per arm, okay? And we need to follow them up for about a year to get an answer. But we need to do lumbar punctures at the, bot at the baseline. And only put people in the trial that have got raised levels. And then repuncture them do another number at, at uh, 6 and 12 months. And we'll see, and the idea is that the drug, this drug, will reduce the spinal level of that protein, okay? Why is this important? It's very important because instead of taking 600 people for 7 years, we can take 60 people for 2 years, and we can in, increase the number of drugs we test in progressive MS by tenfold by using this particular trial. So we put a grant application in to do this for a particular drug and the um, peer reviewers said there's no way you're going to get people with MS to have three lumbar punctures. No way. Okay. So I, I wouldn't accept that. So I designed a little uh, YouTube video. You can look at it if you want. And it explains exactly what we're trying to do with this lumbar puncture study. And we've got people to watch this, people with MS. And then we did a survey after that. And Surprise, surprise, two-thirds of people who watched the video said, oh, I'm prepared to have three lumbar punctures. I completely understand why you want to do these studies. 21% uh, said maybe, and only about 13% that didn't want to do, have three lumbar punctures. Okay? So we went back with this information to this particular, uh, it was the National MS Society in the United States, and they've given us the money to do this study. Right? Um, and the study's about to start. Um, we also asked the community to give a name, and they named the study, it's called the Procs in the study. Okay? It's all on our blog. But I also want to put out um, a positive hope. We haven't forgotten progressive MS. So in, if you've got primary progressive MS, there are currently three trials running. Uh, there's the Fingonimit study, and we'll get the results at the end of this year. Okay, that's the Gelenia study. There's a drug called Ocreluzumab. It's currently fully recruited, and there's a drug called Aquilinbot. <coughs> that drug I showed you that's reduced the shrinkage of the brain. We're about to start a trial in primary progressive MS with that drug as well. If you've got secondary progressive MS, there's a drug called Natalizumab Tysabri, and there's a drug called Saponimid, which is the follow-on drug from Fingolimid currently in trial. So these are the trials that have been done by the industry, the pharmaceutical companies. Um, in terms of uh, our group in London, we involved in a whole lot of studies to test drugs to prevent progression. We've got a, a, a drug called phenytoin. Uh, it's a drug that we use in epilepsy. We're testing it in people with optic neuritis. Remember I said to you that 
after an attack of optic neuritis, you lose one fifth of your nerve fibers. We'll be taking people with optic neuritis and be putting them on this drug as soon as possible to try and protect those nerves from being damaged. Okay, and that's fully, almost fully recruited now. And if that works, it'll obviously take this drug into progressive MS. Um, I already mentioned to you the Proximus trial. Um, we're also about to start to study in late secondary progressive disease called SMART. And we're testing three different drugs there to try and slow down the progression of the disease. And I've just put a grant application into um, the National MS Society and the UK MS Society to test an add-on drug in relapsing <coughs> disease. So this is people who are already on a therapy, interferon or capaxone or gelenia. We're adding in a second drug, a combination drug, to try and slow the brain shrinkage. Okay? So I want, I want to leave you with the message that we're not forgetting about people with progressive disease. We are trying to test drugs to slow down this process. Okay? Slow down this process. So if, um, if you want to hear more about the things we say, we run a research blog, and this is the site. And um, what you've got to realize is that um, we don't really pull our punches, so you've got to be willing to have bad news. Um, we try to give you good news, okay? But our motto is interpreting good, bad, and other research news. So if some people from Australia really follow it, I've just I've forgotten your name. Mike. Mike came to me and said he follows the blog. Um, Australia is now the number fifth, in terms of the number of hits, Australia is number five in the world. And it's quite, number five in the world is a high, considering how small your country is in terms of population. So, um, uh, and I've seen the number of hits from Australia going up all the time. Okay, so uh, if you want to follow the blog, you're welcome. We post almost every single day on the blog. Some of the stuff are quite technical, ignore them. Um, uh, but some of the stuff can be very helpful, so people like it very, very much. That's it. Any questions?